welcome. So in our lesson today, we are going to do a deep dive into the 2023 KCSE Chemistry Paper 2. Wow, that's quite a mouthful. Anyways, I have two videos that I've already posted detailing an explanation on the Chemistry Paper 1. So if you haven't watched them, please do so. I highly recommend it. Now let's start. Question 1. Table 1 gives some properties of the elements in period 3 of the periodic table. So we have a table that lists elements starting from sodium to argon. What these elements have in common, of course, is that they all belong to period 3. What do I mean by period 3? All of these elements are going to have three energy levels in their atoms. So if we start with sodium, sodium has 11 protons as stated by the atomic number. Therefore, it has 11 electrons. So if we were to place these electrons into their respective energy levels, that will give us an electron configuration of 281, magnesium 282, aluminium 283, and so on up to argon where we have an electron configuration of 288. Now, in the case of argon, this is a type of configuration that is known as octet configuration, where you have full energy levels as seen by the eight electrons in the outermost energy level. Now, we also have the atomic radius. So, the atomic radius simply refers to the distance between the center of the nucleus and the outermost energy level in an atom. So, as we can see from the values given, the atomic radius decreases from sodium to argon with argon having the smallest atomic radius. So, let's start with part A. Give the formula and name of the compound formed by the reaction between aluminum and sulfur. So aluminium has a valency of 3, sulfur 2. When these cross, you get a formula of Al2S3. What is the name? It's aluminium sulfide. Now just want to make a point of this. It's not going to be sulfate because we don't have any oxygen atoms present. So sulfide. Part B, explain the variations in the atomic radius of the elements across the period. So the question is simply asking us, why are we having a decrease in the atomic radius as you proceed from left to right? Now that is going to be our first step. Atomic radius decreases across the period. Now on to our explanation. As you move across the period, the atomic number increases, which means the number of protons increases. And this can be clearly seen from the table. So you have sodium having 11 protons, but argon has 18 protons. Now, protons are positively charged particles that highly attract the negatively charged electrons. So you find that the electrons are usually pulled by the positively charged nucleus because of the presence of uh, protons. So you find that if you have an increase in the number of protons, Proton, it's going to increase the effective nuclear charge. So outermost electrons are going to be pulled strongly towards the center, therefore reducing the size of the atom. Now I know some of you might be thinking, do I have to write all these stories she's talking about just to get the two marks? No, don't worry, I've got your back. You only have to write the following and you've earned yourself two full marks. Now moving on to part C. Select the element with the highest ionization energy. Give a reason. Now the element of course is going to be argon. Argon is a noble gas therefore has a stable electronic configuration. Let us just remind ourselves what uh, ionization energy is. So ionization energy is the minimum energy required to remove an electron from the outermost energy level of an atom in the gaseous state. So essentially, you need to remove an electron from argon. Now, as stated before, argon already has a stable electronic configuration. And not only that, it also has the smallest atomic radius. So you can imagine it's going to have a very strong, effective nuclear charge you're going to need a lot of energy to pull an electron from the atom of argon. And there we have it. Part D, write the electron arrangement of phosphorus in PCl3. Now there we have the diagram showing bonding between one phosphorus atom and three chlorine atoms. And as we can see, phosphorus has five valence electrons, but it shares three electrons with three chlorine atoms. So this makes it a total of eight electrons. So our electron configuration is going to be 288. Now if you find covalent bonding tricky, be sure to check out my video where I explain this in detail. Part E, select an element that forms an ion with the smallest ionic radius. Give a reason. Now, this ion, of course, is going to be aluminium. And the reason why it's going to be aluminium is because aluminium has three valence electrons, which it loses to form the aluminium ion. Now, the loss of electrons results in a higher effective nuclear charge. This causes the remaining electrons to be pulled closer towards the nucleus, therefore reducing the ionic radius. Part F. 
Table 2 gives the melting points of some of the elements. So we have table 2 and we have sodium, magnesium, chlorine and argon and their respective melting points. So as we can see, sodium has a lower melting point than magnesium at 98 with magnesium at 650. Again, chlorine and argon with argon having a lower melting point than chlorine. Okay, moving on to the questions. Explain in terms of structure and bonding the differences in the melting points of Roman 1, sodium and magnesium. So essentially the question wants to find out what is the reason that magnesium has a much higher melting point than sodium. Now it all comes down to the metallic bonds. So both sodium and magnesium have metallic bonds. But you find that magnesium has stronger metallic bonds than sodium. And the reason for this comes to two things. Number one, magnesium has more delocalized electrons than sodium. So sodium has the electron configuration of 281. Therefore, one delocalized electron for each atom. Magnesium, on the other hand, contributes to. So more delocalized electrons means that you're going to end up having a stronger metallic bond. Now, another reason is the atomic size. Now, when it comes to magnesium, magnesium tends to have a smaller atom than sodium. So the smaller atom ensures that you're going going to have very strong forces of attraction between the protons and electrons therefore higher melting points than sodium roman 2 the difference in the melting points of chlorine and argon now if you look at the melting points you'll note that both chlorine and argon have low melting points now one thing chlorine and argon exist as gases at room temperatures so they're both gases and they both have low melting points now the reason for this is because they have weak van der waal forces but if you look at the melting points you'll note that that of argon is much lower than that of chlorine and this comes to the way the gases exist so chlorine exists as a diatomic molecule this simply means that you're going to have two chloride atoms covalently bonded to one another while argon on the other hand exists as a monoatomic what does this mean at the end of it chlorine will have more van der waal forces than argon i mean even if they're weak the more the better moving on to question two Complete the following equation. So we have an equation whereby calcium carbide is reacting with water. And yes, that is calcium carbide. So remember from one whereby you are told that if you have a name that ends with IDE, it means that you have a compound containing only two elements. And that is the case here. We have calcium and carbon. So calcium carbide reacts with water. Now this is an equation that is found in organic chem 1 in preparation of ethane. So calcium carbide reacts with water to form calcium hydroxide and ethane gas, of course. Part B, we have pentane and its structure. Now, guys, I want you to look at the structure. That is not the structure of pentane. That is not the structure. There are several mistakes that are present in that diagram. Now, if you look at it, first of all, it has only four carbon atoms. And as we can tell from the name, pent means that we need to have five carbon atoms. So the structure is wrong. Now, another reason why it's also wrong is because if you look at the third carbon atom from the left, you'll find that it has six carbon impossible because carbon atoms can only take a maximum of four bonds now this is the actual structure of pent one ion so in good faith we're just going to go with the question so we are going to imagine that this is the actual structure that was drawn so we are being told that pentane reacts with bromine to form compounds b and c as shown in figure one so pentane first reacts with one mole of bromine to form a compound b and then compound b reacts further with one mole of bromine to form compound c now i know some of you might be scratching their heads wondering guy to lifundi chocolate reactions are pentane no you are not taught that or maybe you are but they're not in the textbook now the reason for this is there's no need for you to be taught this because pentine belongs to the same homologous series as ethane so whatever reactions ethane undertakes will be similar to that of pentine so just imagine if ethane was to react with one mole of bromine what product am i going to have if ethane was to react further with another mole of bromine what product will i form now substitute ethane for pentine and you have your answer now let's proceed step number one when it comes to alkynes if you want them to react the triple bond needs to be broken down to form a double bond and the reason for this is so that you can create open bonds that will fix the bromine atoms onto them now we need to have two open bonds why 
because for every molecule of bromine we have two bromine atoms so you split the triple bond into double bond create two open bonds fill them with bromine atoms and there you have your compound b now compound b was reacted further with one mole of bromine gas so again we are going to further split the double bond to single bonds to create two new open bonds fill them with two bromine atoms and we have our compound c Part C, study the flowchart in figure 2 and answer the questions that follow. Roman 1, give the reagents and conditions used in number 1, step 2. Okay, so where's step 2? Ah, there we have it. So we are having a process whereby ethene is converted to ethane. Now, that is ethene and this is ethane. I want you to look at this and tell me what has changed, what has been added to change ethene to ethane. Guys, it's obvious, right? Hydrogen. So our reagent is going to be hydrogen. Now, what is the condition? Now, the condition, you're supposed to mention one condition. So there are actually two conditions here. Number one is presence of a catalyst. So the catalyst can either be nickel or palladium. Either is correct. And high temperatures of 180 degrees Celsius. Now, I want to say this. You've been asked for one condition, but there are two conditions that are correct and that you can give. But I want you to refrain from doing that. When you are asked a question, wherever you're told to mention a single condition, ensure you write just one condition and the right one. And the reason for this is because in chemistry during marking, if you write a wrong condition or a wrong answer, it cancels out the right one. So limit yourself. Now, another thing is with regards to temperature. So, for example, you may find that some books or even some marking schemes might state that temperatures within a certain range and then they give you the range. Don't do that. Never give a range when you're writing your answers. Stick to a particular temperature within that range. For example, in this, a correct range will be between 150 to 250 degrees Celsius. Choose a temperature within that range, such as in this case, 180 degrees Celsius. Capish? Roman number two, step seven. So let's take a look at step seven, okay? So we have sodium ethanoate leading to the formation of methane gas. Now, sodium ethanoate is actually used in the preparation of methane where it reacts with soda lime to form methane and sodium carbonate. So our reagent is soda lime. By the way, soda lime is a mix of sodium hydroxide with calcium oxide. It's actually the sodium hydroxide that reacts with the sodium ethanoate. What is the condition that needs to be present? Simple, heat. Roman number three, write an equation for the reaction that takes place in step one. Now, if we take a look at step one, we can clearly see that this is a polymerization reaction. So ethene molecules have the ability to react with each other to form a long chain molecule known as polyethene. So in this case, each molecule of ethene is known as a monomer. When monomers join together, they form a polymer. So our polymer in this case is polyethene and it can be illustrated as such. Roman 3, name the type of reaction that takes place in step 4. So in step 4, we have ethanol being oxidized to ethanoic acid. So the reaction, of course, is oxidation. In step 2, we have ethene to ethane. Now we talked about this, okay? So this is simply hydrogenation. Roman 4, draw the structure of organic compound D. Now if you look at organic compound D, this is a compound that is formed when ethanol and ethanoic acid react with one another. So in short, when an alkanol reacts with an alkanoic acid. Now you might be wondering, hey, what are these? Now in form 4 in organic chemistry too, you're going to be introduced to alkanols and alkanoic acids. Now an alkanol is simply a group of organic compounds that contains of course carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. It also has a hydroxyl group you know OH which is the functional group of the series now when it comes to alkanoic acids these are also organic compounds but they have a functional group of co you know a carboxyl group now when these two react with one another they lead to the formation of a compound known as an ester and water this reaction is known as esterification and it's catalyzed by an acid. The usual acid that is used is concentrated sulfuric 6 acid. The ester that is formed has a sweet fruity smell often described as a pleasant smell. Okay, let's start with the chemical equation. So we have ethanol, that is the formula of ethanol, C2H5OH. 
And then we have the alkanoic acid, the ethanoic acid over there, CH3COOH. Now, when these two react, the hydroxyl group of ethanol reacts with the hydrogen atom from the ethanoic acid. And this, of course, leads to the formation of a water molecule. So whatever components remain form the ester. And the name of this ester is ethyl ethanoic. Question 3, part A. Explain how an increase in temperature affects the rate of a chemical reaction. Okay, so what happens is that when you increase the temperature, it's going to increase the rate of the reaction. Why? Because an increase in temperature increases the kinetic energy of the particles. This will lead to more effective collisions. Now, in case you're wondering, what are effective collisions? When reacting particles collide with one another, leading to the formation of a product, that is what is termed as effective or successful collisions. Now, in case you're interested in this, be sure to check out my videos on Cyclic, where I have several videos explaining these in detail. Part B. Consider the following gaseous reaction. So we have a reaction between nitrogen 2 oxide and hydrogen gas leading to the formation of nitrogen 1 gas and water. So this is at equilibrium as seen by the half-sided double arrows. So according to the question, explain how an increase in pressure affects the rate of this reaction. Now before we answer this, let's just uh, explain a, a little bit. So when it comes to pressure, a change in pressure will only affect equilibrium in reactions involving gases, such as in this case. It has no effect whatsoever on reactions whereby the reactants and products are either solids or liquids, because these two cannot be compressed or expanded. Now, in our case, we are having a reaction whereby the reactants and products are all gases, so of course, pressure is going to be a factor. Now, if you were to increase the pressure, how will this affect the reaction? Will it favor the forward reaction or the backward reaction? That is essentially what the question is asking us. Now, before we answer this question, let us just look at the number of moles of gases that are present on the left and right side of the equation. So on the left side, we have two moles of nitrogen 2 oxide reacting with one mole of hydrogen gas, a total of three moles. On the other side, we have one mole of nitrogen 1 oxide reacting with one mole of two of one water molecule. So two moles in total. So as you can see, we have three moles on one side, two moles on the other side. An increase in pressure will always favor the side that has fewer molecules or fewer moles. So that means that if we were to increase the pressure, it's going to favor the forward reaction. And the reason for this is because by favoring the forward reaction, you're going to find that particles will be brought closer to one another, leading to more effective collisions. Part C. At high temperatures, NO2 and CO gases react as shown in the following equation. The reaction was monitored by measuring the changes in the concentration of nitrogen 2 oxide with time. Table 3 shows the data obtained. So we have a, t a table that shows us how the concentration of nitrogen 2 oxide varies with time. Now we are supposed to plot on the grid provided a graph of the concentration of nitrogen 2 oxide against time. And that is how the graph is supposed to be. And those are the points of note that you're supposed to take into consideration when you're drawing the graph. If you want to make a note of the graph, kindly pause the video and do so. Roman 2. Use the graph to determine the rate of the reaction in the time interval 25 seconds and 75 seconds. So for us to do so, what we're going to do is that we are going to determine the change in the y-axis over the change in the x-axis. So by doing so, we will first identify the points on the graph corresponding to t25 seconds and t75 seconds. So this will give us a value of 19.5 minus 9 over 75 minus 25 and our final answer of 0.21 moles per liters per second. Roman 3, give a reason why the rate of the reaction decreases with time. Now, the reason is because as the reaction continues, the concentration of the reactants decreases because the reactants are simply being used up. Moving on to question 4, part A. Figure 3 shows how the temperature of lead changes as it is heated. Roman 1, label on the diagram the states present on the regions CD and EF. So, in CD, lead is going to be in liquid state. EF in gaseous state. Roman 2. Explain why the temperature remains constant in regions BC and DE. Now, the explanation for both is going to be the same. The reason is because the energy absorbed is used to convert the solid to liquid at constant temperature. This is for BC. 
At DE, the energy absorbed is used to convert the liquid into a gas. Do you remember this in Form 1? So in Form 1, when you talked about heating curve over substance, whenever it's constant, it simply shows you that the temperature remains constant until all the substance changes from one set to another. The reason why there's no increase in temperature is because the heat that is being supplied is used to weaken the forces of attraction holding the particles together. So there's not going to be any increase in temperature until finally all the bonds holding the particles together have been broken down leading to a change in state.